I, I was asked to, well, not asked, I volunteered to come up here again because <clears throat> I enjoyed doing it the first time I was up here. And so I was uh, eager to jump at the opportunity to do another 15 minutes. And I thought that this time I was going to do great. I was going to, I was going to really nail those 15 minutes. And then last Sunday, I was talking to Ryan and realized that um, I was not doing 15 minutes. There was no one that was going to help me. I was doing the whole, the whole time by myself. So needless to say, I had an early breakfast this morning in preparation for uh, an early lunch, possibly. We'll see how it goes. So uh, we're starting a new series this week called uh, How Do I Fulfill God's Mission? And uh, to start off this, this series of how is it that we fulfill God's mission and, and God's plans for our lives, it led me to um, believing and feeling something that I feel very strong about. And that is, to me, that this is, it's something that we hear about a lot, that God has a mission and he has a plan for all of our lives. And we hear about it a lot in church. Um, it's something that we've been hearing, and at least I've been hearing since I was little. Uh, I hear it repeated all the time that, you know, God has a plan for us. He has a mission for each and every one of us, and we just need to fulfill his purpose and fulfill our calling. And it's not to say that I think that this is a bad thing. In fact, this is a wonderful thing. It's a great thing. And I think it's an incredible thing that, and an exciting life-altering revelation that God reveals to us in his word that he has a, a plan and a mission for, for each and every one of us. But what I am displeased with in my, in my life is that I personally have taken that knowledge and the knowledge I have, we all have of biblical promises like these and we've, I, I specifically have watered them down to a point in which my heart the heart-moving, life-altering changes that these holy words entail become bland. They become something I just repeat to myself. Like I said, I'm guilty of this, and in fact, it's because of my own guilt that I have come to these feelings. And I was unsure how to approach this message when I got what the, the, the topic would be for this week, because I had thought that, you know, this is a message that I've heard before, a message that God has a mission for my life, and he has a plan for my life, and it's just, I need to follow it, and it's, I mean, that's a message that I've heard, like I said, many times, and I didn't think there was anything I could really do with it that was going to be, you know, heart-moving and heart-changing, which is what I want to do when I get up here, is I, I want to share the things that I learn and the things that I've grown to love about God, and I want to share them with other people. And when I, when I, when I get something, I, I, I started to think selfishly about how it is that I could put a spin on this and how it is that I could make this something unique and I could share the love that I feel in my heart instead of letting God use it in the way that he had. And it was in that moment when I followed that train of thought and I started thinking in ways that I, I, I thought that this was not going to be unique, it was going to be something, just a, a regular God has a plan for your life sermon that my heart broke. Because I became appalled at how easily I had fallen into a rut of devaluing the word of God. And how I so easily had taken for granted the things I hear repeated in church and in the Christian life. And as I lose the weight of those words, and they no longer become overflowing with God's honor and glory. And my heart made the mistake of making those words mundane. I implore you to not make the same mistake that I did, and do not fall into the habit of making the words of God just words. I think sometimes we can trick ourselves into doing this. Sometimes we, I just, we just show up to church and get into a routine of convincing ourselves that we are doing right by God. 
But God doesn't just want us to show up. He doesn't want us to turn his incredible and overwhelming love into something we settle ourselves into comfortably. An overwhelming love that we never move in, we never act or we never share it with anyone. He wants our responses and he wants our hearts to move with his. He wants us to respond to him daily. That is what we should want also. As Christians, we should desire this because this is who we are in Christ. Despite the shortcomings of my heart, though, I know that there is hope. And I tell you these things, these feelings that I have, because I want to show you who it is that I truly am. And I want to share with you my struggles as someone getting up here and preaching to you today. And I want you to know how much it is that I struggle. I want you to know that I am just as much a sinner, if not more so, than anyone in this room. That I am, in fact, the worst person that I know. I know everything that I do. And one of my favorite verses is, is something that Paul says, which really speaks to me, which is 1 Timothy 1 through 15. It says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. I say this because despite all of that, despite everything I think about myself, I am still used by God. I am used to fulfill the mission that he has and as unassuming as I am, and if he can do that with someone like me, I think that he can most definitely do it with all of you. Today, I want to look at a few other people who are just as unlikely and just as unassuming. One who is the most unlikely person to ever turn to God, and the other one was just some guy. Because of his, and because of his response to God, assisted, he assisted in the greatest conversion in the Bible. This man's name was Ananias, and that unlikely convert was Saul, who we know later becomes Paul. He's not Paul, he's not Paul in this moment right now. We're going to start in Acts chapter 9, verse 10. But right before this, Saul, who was on his way to Damascus to arrest and imprison people, people like Ananias, for being believers in Jesus Christ, he was blinded by the glory of Jesus, both figuratively and literally. <clears throat> we leave him sitting in blindness, not eating or drinking for three days, as he spends his time in darkness, in prayer, which we will find out later. So now, we're go I'm going to open up and we're going to read Acts chapter 9, verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision, and a, man, and a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. So we don't know anything about Ananias, other than what we get in these few verses. Ananias is just is kind of existing. And then after this, we never really hear from him again. But what we, can, what we read from him was that we can assume that he was just an average believer. He was just an average disciple. He was um, probably in Damascus because of the scattering that had happened of believers from Jerusalem. And in some versions of this, it describes Ananias as a certain disciple which I think is a perfect way of describing this guy because that is what he was, just a certain guy, just a plain, regular person. 
But yet, because of his response to God's calling, as we read, he was used in a way to bring forth one of God's greatest champions. And because of this, because of his willingness to respond to God, he became part of one of the most fruitful missions that God had enacted in that time. But why was Ananias used, though? Why did God choose Ananias? Why did God use someone who was just an unknown to bring Saul into spiritual life? I believe it was to make Saul's conversion truly God-glorifying. If someone like an apostle or a religious leader had gone to Saul, someone like Peter or James or uh, anyone that was a a big, uh, well-known believer of Jesus Christ, if any of them had come to him, people would say that he was convinced, or people could have said that he was converted to faith by a man, instead of by the blinding holiness of an encounter with Jesus Christ. God used a man who was so obscure so that God would absolutely get all of the credit that God would get the glory for the miraculous conversion and not man. In fact, Paul reminds us of this in Galatians. In Galatians 11, it says, For I would, have know, or I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now Ananias was also sent a vision, just like Paul was sent a vision earlier, but his vision was very different. Ananias's vision was a very sweet vision that starkly contrasted the bold vision that Saul has earlier. Saul was loudly and suddenly approached by Jesus in a way that commanded his attention, demanding a response from Saul. But in contrast, Ananias was called gently by him, and he willingly responded, Here I am, Lord. I think that this is a good representation of how God interacts with his children, depending on our willingness to listen to him. We all choose a different way to respond to God. How do we respond, though? Would we be talked to sweetly because of our willingness to say, Here I am, Lord? Or would we need to be approached by God boldly as to demand our submissive attention? Sometimes we fall into this habit of not wanting to respond to God, and unfortunately, because of our human nature, We sometimes need that wake-up call. And in verse 11 and 12, God tells us, tells Ananias to rise and go to a street called Straight. And not only does he tell Ananias to go to a street, a specific street called Straight, he tells him to go to a house owned by a man named Judas. And then when he gets to the street called Straight, and he gets to the house owned by a man named Judas, he's going to go inside and see a man from Tarsus named Saul. And once he sees that man from Tarsus named Saul, God told him that he would be praying. And not only would he be praying, he would be praying and a man would appear to him, a man named Ananias. And Ananias would then lay his hands on him so that he would regain his sight. Now, the odd thing I think about this is that God is incredibly specific in these details that he gives him. He tells him the street, he tells him the house, he tells him the man, he tells him what the man will be doing, and he tells him what he will be doing to the man. But why are there so many details given? Why is God so detailed in in these two verses on what it is exactly Ananias should do? I believe that this is because God was giving Ananias confirmations. 
God was giving him specific, a specific and detailed plan because God was ask, what God was asking him to do, in Ananias' view, was something incredibly dangerous, something that was going to put his life on the line. Ananias knew this, which if we look in verses 13 and 14, it says, But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Ananias knew who this man Saul was. Most believers did, in fact. I, I, I begin to wonder if Saul and the persecution of the temple, and, spe and specifically Saul, was not the reason that he was in Damascus in the first place. I don't know that, but it's possible because, the, as I said before, the believers were scattering all over from Jerusalem because of the persecutions. And I, I may, we may never know if he was actually there because he was fleeing Saul specifically. But what I do know is that God is faithful to us when he calls us to his mission. And I think the bigger and bolder thing God calls us to do, the more gracious he is with his confirmations. He gives us confirmations to let us know that, yes, this is what I want you to do. This is where I need you to go. Because God does not have a habit of abandoning his people, especially in hard and difficult times when we're acting out and acting on his missions, on his calls. He will not ever leave us flailing in the dark. He is a loving God who is there for his people always. Sometimes we just need to look and we need to respond to what we see. We get some, so caught up in details sometimes that we forget obvious things that God gives us as confirmations to let us know that, hey, this is what I need from you. This is what I want you to do. I want to change up real quick and go back to verse 11, and I want to look back at Saul. Because on here it says, in here it says, look for a man named, uh, from Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And if you're wondering why I think this is significant uh, for, the, for this section where it says, behold, he will be praying. And why, why it is I think this is so significant is because I think this is the first indication that we get that there is a true change that's beginning to happen in Saul. And what, what I see is that for the first time possibly ever, we see Paul praying, truly praying. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, Saul was... Saul was also guilty of going through the motions and repeating things and not really having his heart in things. And I think that he prayed many times going through the motions of prayer that he was taught, but I, never th I don't think he actually ever prayed for real. He never truly opened himself up to communications with God. And I think if we go back here to Galatians, we'll see that Paul himself says that he uh, was guilty of going through the motions. Back here where I left off in Galatians 12, or in Galatians 11, 1, 13. For you have heard of of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. See, I think Paul was living 
a life that was untrue because he was just going through the motions. He was going through traditions that he had been taught for his father, by his father and by the temple. I think he was living in darkness, pretending to see the light. And sometimes I feel guilty of that. Pretending that I know what it means to be in deep prayer when really I'm just going through the motions, or really I'm just repeating prayers of, for meals and for bedtime and just things that I, I don't really have my heart in it. I'm not really talking to God. I'm just reading off a script. And it shouldn't have taken someone who is part of the temple, <clears throat> who was supposed to be the closest of the people of that day to God, to be blinded and have a life-shaking encounter with God for him to finally, for once in his life, pray earnestly. It shouldn't take a life-blinding encounter for us to pray earnestly either. But sometimes, like I said, we have a fallen nature, we make mistakes, and, and sometimes it does take those life-changing and life-altering events to get us to truly communicate with God. Saul was praying earnestly now to God. His heart was open to God, which is why Ananias was now coming to him, because the change was happening. Instead of mouthing the words of prayers that Saul knew, Saul's heart was now truly in it, genuinely towards turn towards God, which is what true prayer is. This is why God said in verse 11, Behold, he is praying. He had said many prayers before, but now he was truly praying. And not only was he praying, he was beginning to respond to God. Getting back to the conversation between God and Ananias, picking up here back in verse 15, I love how God responds to the concerns of Ananias. Ananias is doing that thing we do a lot, where God is, is telling us to do something, and we, we are always saying, oh, I don't know, God, do you know who this Saul is? Like, we're, we try to tell God things that he may not know. Like, this Saul guy, he is no good. He is out here hunting down all your children, and this guy is the guy you want me to go to, he may be hunting for me. And then, though we do this, God, in this instance, gives such a beautiful God-like response, and he does it all the time to us in our regular lives. This is so in character for God. This is what he says in verse 15. He says, But the Lord said to him, Go, go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. He was a chosen instrument of mine. Despite all that he's done, despite all the persecutions he carried out, despite all the sins he had committed, he was a chosen instrument of mine. And that's not something that is wholly reserved for Saul. Yes, in this, this specific instance of this verse, in the way that it says that he will carry my name to the Gentiles and to the kings and to the, to the people of Israel. I don't think, I don't know for sure, but I imagine that we're not going to carry the word to kings or to Israelites. But we all are still chosen instruments of God. And, and looking outside this verse, we see that even here in this instant, was not Ananias a chosen instrument of God? And we know that Saul, who will became an instrument of God, just like God said he would. So what would keep us from being instruments of God? What would set us apart from these men? What could, what could be different? What could, what could prevent us from being instrument of God? 
I think the only thing that it comes down to is how we respond. How do we respond to God? Our daily responses can be the deciding factor on whether we step in to being a chosen instrument of God or we don't. It is solely on us. God has chosen us. We know this. He has planned to use us. And he did that the moment that we all accepted him into our lives. But that doesn't just happen. That isn't just something that we can sit back and let unfold on its own without our active involvement. God does not need us to do great things. But he wants us. He wants us involved. He wants us so badly. He wants us to respond to his calling. So how is it that we can just sit back and watch glory go by and not want to take a part of it? Not want to take an active role in spreading it? He is calling you, and he is calling me. He wants us to, he wants to use us for his mission. And he just wants us to respond. You know, not many things move my heart in the way that God's word does. And it moves it so much that sometimes I, I can't even talk about it without choking up. And I think this has become one of those instances where I, I see these words and it just changes something in my heart. And it makes me want to act and it makes me want to respond to God because I don't. I don't want to watch all of these things happen without me. I want to be a part of the kingdom work. And Ananias wanted to be part of God's work too. Ananias could have said no. To God's calling. He could have said, I'm not going because it's too dangerous. I don't want to go near this man. But he didn't. He answered the call and he became the instrument and became part of God's mission. He did this despite the danger and there was danger. Ananias didn't know that, the, that Saul wouldn't kill him as soon as he uh, lost his blindness as soon as he, he, he restored his sight. But God's missions are never without risk. God doesn't hide the ball from us. He tells us this. He's honest with us about the risks that we'll have. I mean, he's even honest with Ananias in these verses. In verse 16, he says, for I, for I will show him, talking about Paul, I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. There is going to be suffering and there's going to be hardship when you choose to follow God, when you choose to respond to him daily. But is that something that will stop you? Will that be the thing that keeps you from being an instrument of God? I know for me it is. It's scary. I don't want to be hurt. I love being comfortable. We all love being comfortable. But as I said, when I read this scripture, when I, when I see the words of God, when I see God talk so sweetly about a man who was so wicked at the time and so against Jesus, when I see him say things like this to say, but the Lord said, go, for he is my chosen instrument. I don't know how you don't respond to that. And I don't know how that doesn't make you feel like you want to follow God to the ends of the earth. It's hard to think of sweeter things that God has said. mine. He is mine. He's my chosen instrument. I want to move on and I want to finish up this section, this section 
of verses that I'm reading today, and I want to go over verse 17 through 19 and finish it off. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose, and he was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Verse 17 was something that opened my eyes. It opened my eyes to something that is everywhere in the Bible that I'd never thought about before, that I've never really seen before. And I bring it up because I don't want you to miss it. I think that it is something incredible, and it, it's just so simple. And it's the way that, that the start of the verse is. I think this is the, one of the greatest things that you can read everywhere in the Bible. Ananias, after having this conversation with God about going and doing dangerous things, and Ananias saying, God, this, this guy is, is a killer, are you sure? What happens? What does Ananias do? It's really simple, really quick. It's easy to miss. It's just at the beginning. It says, so Ananias departed and entered the house. And that's it. That's one of my favorite things to read in the Bible, and it's everywhere. Those little parts of verses. It's those short, short sections in the verse that you would never think about, but it can be world-changing. God told someone to do something, and what? They just do it. That's it. That's what it takes to fulfill God's mission. God says, I need you to do something. And you say, yes, Lord, I'll do it. And I think sometimes we make it so much more complicated than it needs to be. We always seem to have to hem and haul all the reasons that we can't do something. So we sit and when we pray about it, we dwell on it and we say, ah, oh God, is this really what you want me to do? Is this really what I should do? Should I really act here? I'm not sure. And so we stay in prayer and we keep, we keep being in prayer and we never act. And Ananias didn't do that. He didn't say, God, that's great that you want to convert Saul, so let me pray for whoever it is that you think should go and talk to him. We do that a lot, and I do that a lot. I say prayers like, God, bless whoever it is you're going to send to do your mission. God, I pray that you be with whoever it is that you are wanting to serve in the community. I pray that you be with whoever it is that is going to serve a church. I will pray for them continuously while I stay home. I'm choosing to end my sermon on this tiny part of this verse because I think that it has a massive significance for our lives. I think it can be one of the greatest things that we could use to change our lives. And we are all part of God's mission. We're his children. We are chosen and handpicked by God to be his instruments and to be his tools for his glory. We just need to be that. We need to be those instruments for God, and we need to say yes, and just do it. Like Ananias did. It doesn't have to be some grand turning around of our lives. Just like this isn't some grand, well-known verse that sticks out to us in our Bibles. It's just a tiny section of a tiny verse 
from a much larger verse in a much larger chapter in a much larger book. But it is that tiny section of that verse that changed everything in the life of Ananias, in the life of Saul, and it can be that tiny section that can change your life too. So Ananias departed and entered the house. God said, go. It's not a knowledge of everything biblical. It's not the appearance of having it all together. All you need to be a chosen, precious instrument of God is a willingness to respond to him whenever he calls. He just wants you to respond. He just wants you. He wants you to obey. He wants so badly to use you for his mission. So please do not let that opportunity pass you by. Answer his call. Walk into his glory and his mission and you live your life as a chosen instrument. A chosen instrument of God. Just say, yes, I will go. Be like Ananias and just depart. As I let the band come back up here, I don't want to say, you know, if God has a mission in your heart right now, that you should act on it. You know whether or not God has something in you that he wants you to do. So I, I don't need to tell you. You're probably thinking about it right now. Some of us may not have missions that we need to complete right now. God may not have anything for us, but he does have one thing that he gave us, that he gave all of his believers. And it comes in Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. Like I said, you may not have some grand mission in your heart that you need to complete, or maybe you do. All I'm asking you today is that you do have a mission, regardless of whether you have anything else that God wants you to do. And it's that he wants you to go and make disciples. And like I said, it can be scary, and it can be difficult and uncomfortable to do. But that's what God calls us to do, and he doesn't hide that from us. But we can take heart in knowing that, like he says, that God said, I'm surely with you. Jesus will surely be with you always until the end of the age. And we need to live out what it is that God has put in our hearts to do his mission and to respond to him daily.